This is a moment in Jewish history. The Betzago Academy of Arts and Design was founded in 1906 in Jerusalem by Boris Schatz. The old stone building still stands today on the corner of Betzago and Schatz Street and today houses the Department of Architecture. I have been there many times and was always struck by an image in the entrance of Boris Schatz meeting Betzago from the Bible, the chief artisan of the Jewish people and the man appointed to design the tabernacle representing the school's philosophy of combining the modern with an appreciation for history. Last week, I attended the graduate student exhibition held at the new Bitzelo building, which houses the other departments and was open this year. Located in the historic Russian compound area, I met the ingenious young students of the Department of Industrial Design. I saw a flying defibrillator, smart clothing woven from e-textile, a watch for blind people, and more artistic inventions. You will hear from the students shortly. I also spoke to the head of the Industrial Design Department, Professor Ido Bruno, who has been teaching there since the 1990s. Professor Bruno is a great nephew of Samuel Hershenberg, the noted artist who was personally recruited by Schatz to teach at the school over 100 years ago. Professor Bruno was a student himself there, as was his mother, and now his nephew, making the family four generations affiliated with Betzalel. Back in 1906, the school taught traditional sculpture and painting and had workshops in silver, leather, wood, brass, and fabric. Many of the students, like Schatz, were Jews from Eastern Europe who were escaping persecution. Other craftsmen were Yemenite Jewish silversmiths who had a long tradition in Yemen of working in silver and gold. Betzala was forced to close in 1929 due to financial difficulties, but when the Nazis came to power, it reopened, and in 1935, it had attracted many teachers and students from Germany. For many years, besides the historic building on Betzala Street, most of the classes were held on Mount Scopus at the campus of Hebrew University until this year when the school returned to the city center. And that's where I arrived, to a brand new glass and steel building tucked in between the towering Russian church and historic Russian compound prison. Inside was a dazzling display of unique clothing, glasswork, innovative animated films and video games, paintings and ceramics. But I was drawn to the practical inventions in the Department of Industrial Design. Here are some of the graduate students I met. My name is Rafael Amzalag. I created an ultralight backpacking tent. I wanted to find a new way to create a construction without using regular poles for the tent. So automatically I was pushed into the category of hiking pole tents, which are tents that are held by the trekking or hiking poles and are pinned in the ground. The goal was to create the tent that will weigh the least and will also give you a good experience of sleeping in it. So it's the biggest tent in its category and weighs just under a kilo, 872 grams. That includes the stakes. In the daytime, you walk with your hiking poles and then you uh, use them for your base construction of the tent. If you have two tents, you can merge them together to create a shared space that you can cook in or talk or sit after the tent. It has a lot more features that are included. How long does it take to put up? Uh, It takes about a few experience at it and the soil is is not too hard, then it could take uh, between 30 seconds to, to a minute. But if it's, uh, it's a bit harder, then maybe like uh, three, four minutes. That's pretty quick. So some snaps are meant to keep the tent pinned to the ground. Some snaps are located right under the zippers. So if a strong wind comes and uh, wants to push all the zippers up, it keeps it locked and tight. You also have snaps that keep two vents open to help with airflow. And also some snaps, magnetic snaps that keep the doors open are very comfortable opening and closing because they, they're magnetic. How is this manufactured? So this one I cut it myself. Then I, a uh, guy helped me sew the entire thing. But in the future, um, it's already going to be manufactured in They have automatic machines that cut it with lasers, so it's very accurate. And then uh, people that will sew it by hand. 
Tell us why you personally decided to make this tent based on your personal um, experiences camping. It's not for camping, it's for hiking and uh, trekking mostly and backpacking. So I usually uh, like to carry a small backpack when I go travel outside of the country. You can see here later uh, the small backpack I take, it goes with me on the plane. So the goal is to save as much room and weight as possible. That's what I wanted to do with this tent, to make the smallest and most compact tent the lightest that I can get to. And also, I'm, a, I'm kind of a big guy, so I like to have my space inside a tent. So I wanted the tent to be spacious when I sleep in it and not be uh, cramped and small. And tell us about Betzalel and you know, what you thought about the classes over these past four years and the different things you built. A lot of the stuff I built have been for backpacking and for hiking. Not everything, because I, I wanted to try other fields too. But they basically taught me how to take an idea and find if it's relevant for the outside and the real world. And how to create a real functioning product from it. That's what I uh, did also here and also in the past four years I've been in this degree. Hi, uh, my name is Aviara Vive. My motivation to make all the dry toilet paper in uh, nature to disappear. So I discovered that in poop there is still bacteria that want to eat food. So I uh, started to dry uh, some vegetables and fruits to find a good material and I discovered the orange. The orange, the fruit, not the peel, that also soft and flexible. So I discovered the orange and there's a lot of people that try it. Then when there was a material, I added seeds. So uh, also the poop will make the seeds to grow. Okay. So uh, yeah. the, the poo helps compost the seeds yeah. and then they grow. Okay. Also, she made the toilet paper thicker, so it's not like the regular paper that you have to fold. It has the right thickness. And it biodegrades. This is just for you to take. You can. And, it, and it biodegrades faster than regular toilet paper. I'm out of the. Yeah, it's soft and uh, you can try it. I think it's, I uh, get to a material that I uh, really trust it to be like almost everything from bags to a package of food. If I uh, play a little bit with the materials and drying, it can be harder or thicker or uh, flexible. I think there's a lot of uh, potential in this material. My name is Mayan Cohen Baron. Endometriosis is a chronic disease that affects one of ten women. The average period of the time to diagnose the disease is about 11 years. In my project, I made underwear, smart underwear with e-textile that can help self-diagnose the disease. It also has heating pads inside, so it will help the pain. And you sewed this stuff and designed it? Yes, I did. The shape is based on the symbol of endometriosis. It's like breast cancer, but in yellow. Red flowers are kind of what the disease looks in reality. So you took something that's a sickness and you made it pretty. Yes, I did. I have also endometriosis. It took 15 years to diagnose me. So it's my biggest victory <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to finish Betzalel with this disease. It's not so easy. I have a lot of pain, especially to do something good from my bad experience. It's what I wanted to do and I did it. And did you talk to doctors or who else did you work with on designing this? First of all, my research started when I thought I'm sick so I have like 10 years of research I did on myself and of course I went to doctors I interviewed them and I talked with a lot of companies that make underwear for periods that's how I chose the fabrics and the technologies in it 
What do you think about Betzalel now that you're graduating? I'm from Jerusalem, so all of my life I've heard about Betzalel. I'm very happy to finish in this new beautiful building. What other projects have you done in your four years here? Last year, I made a project. I made rings, except the diamonds. I put coffee beans because coffee nowadays is very rare. It's going to be more rare and more expensive. So I, I put it in the rings so it will be like diamonds. Anything else you want to say about your project or Betzalel or anything? I think one of the most important things I did in my projects is to people to know about endometriosis. It's very common, one in ten women has it. It's very painful and if you know what you have, it can change your life. My name is Ran Stub. It's a defibrillator. First purpose of the defibrillator is not to be used in the city. It should be used out the city. And it's to have places that are inaccessible and to bring the, the ability for the first aid for a heart attack, for example, to solve the problem that there are today. I came to the idea with a story about my father that died, that passed away in 2004 because of riding a bicycle and it was here on the mountain in Jerusalem and the ambulance just flipped over on the side and it took so much time to bring the first response to the person. And with my hobby that I'm today flying in a remote control airplanes, I combined all of them together to be able to fly in the first stage of the drone. It flies most like a missile, long range missile, this is the correct name of it and to be able to land as a drone, as a multi-rotor, with a precise landing, with a soft landing, and then the defibrillator has two handles on the sides that you can carry him for the last mile, as we say so, closer to the person who is uh, injured, and then you will be able to attach the pads on him and to apply the defibrillator. This is the main issue when it can be reach up to 18 up to 15 kilometers with a speed of 300 kilometers per hour it will take approximately two and a half minutes in the overall the critical time is four up to five minutes to help a person if we will reach up to five minutes we will be able to save 70 percent of the people that have heart attack so i'm i'm in a nature trail in the middle of a park and i'm having a heart attack and I call the paramedics, and the paramedics fly in this device, sure. and then I attach it to myself, or no, how does... Uh, yeah. As for today, there is no... You won't be able to attach it by yourself because you are in hard condition, so it always be necessary, even in the city, for the second person. So the second person call MADA, for example, in Israel, then MADA choose to launch the rocket, then the rocket receive the place, the second person take the drone closer to the person, he attach the pads on the body of the person who is having a heart attack, and then we need the second person to activate. But even if I'm on a camping trip maybe, and there's other people... True, true. If there are different people who can help you and to make, let's say, to help you with the last mile of it, so there is no problem, because you don't need to make a lot of things of it. The door is designed to be opened very fast without any hinge or something that might, uh, let's say, stop you with doing it fast. And then you just need to uh, attach the pads and then you are ready to go. It means you can electric the, the person and then, like a normal defibrillator, it works. And, you, and I see you have like a blueprint and you have the actual device. And how did you build this? You, you personally built this and attached the motors and everything? Yeah, it was designed in a 3D in SolidWorks. I designed it and put it also in the wind tunnel to understand what is the dynamic that works on the aircraft. I took the length of the distance that I need to reach, what is the weight, the total weight of the aircraft. I calculated it with the person who is aeronautical engineering from the Technion and he helped me, helped me to understand what is the profile that we should put on it. And with this, all the motors that we see here in the models, in the real models, belong to the right weights and to the right size. 
and the blueprint it's true it's to show all the components that are inside of the aircraft. So I shouldn't call it a drone? Uh, it's a combination. Yeah, there is something that we have today, a drone slash, we can say, multi-rotor that have few rotors and will be able to fly uh, and to hover. Air pulse, it's something in between a long-range missile to a multi-rotor. It's kind of VTOL, but it's more like a missile. So it's the combination between both of them. So it's a UAV in the end. And what do you think of Petsara now that you're graduating? I think that it's a good point to start to earn all the first stages to see the world. And I say the world and not only the life in different shape and to understand that they have different meaning. Even if someone puts you know, kind of a handle and to push it or to pull it, those are different kind of thinking. And I think that Betzalel gives you the way to think differently and to see and to have a different approach for different things and then you will be able to solve it. My name is Arad Rubinovich. It's more than just a bag, it's actually a system. Well, I was in the search and rescue in the Israeli army in the IDF and something about the preparedness of Israel for earthquake, it's something that stays with me. So I decided to do a project in Betulel about the preparedness for earthquakes. So it's actually a system when in each neighborhood there is a team that in the case of an aircraft, they just jump immediately after that and they help in the community can gather together and actually deal with, with what happened. They rescue people, they help in people, other people. They try to rescue the family, they try to rescue the friends, they give them the tools. It's really simple tools. It's not something that needs higher maintenance or a lot of guidance and they're helping them to do it the correct way. After an earthquake, there is so chaos and there isn't enough teams to do all of that. So all the easy jobs and all the immediate jobs, I, I wanted to, to find a solution to help that. It's helping the system that already exists. It's not switching it. It's just coming to be with it. And I see we have a walkie-talkie and some tools. And what are all these items in here? Okay. So the tools. There is tools just to protect the rescue teams and the citizens when they do the, the search and rescue itself. And the other tools are for the search and rescue. So we have the walkie-talkie to communicate between the people themselves, between the team, so they would know in which places in the neighborhood and in the other neighborhoods you need to be, where is the damage. Because people, after earthquakes, a lot when building or falling, you need to just remove a lot of stones to get to the people. And while people do that, to get to their family, to get to their friends, they actually injure themselves. So just for that, I have extra for those. So they will bring to the citizens. To remove the stones, to lift it up, to break it, and to go through doors and stuff like that. Yeah. This is the major of how it's work, like those five categories. You need to break it, you need to remove it, you need to lift it. Tell us maybe something about events that you personally participated in. I actually never participated in something like that. I practiced for years, and this is something to know not about just Israel, about all the crews, all the systems in the world. We don't have enough people when there is an airstrike, when there is such a big event, we don't have enough people for that. We need the people, we need the community to help us. We need to work together to go through that. But a lot of us go through life and we practice and we practice. And sometimes we get to get in real events, but a lot of the time we're just practicing. And that's okay. It's okay, but it's also important to give the information to other people as many as possible. Okay. And what are your feelings about Betzalel now that you're graduating? I think Betzalel is a great school. And I would say it's because of a few things. Because we have a lot of teachers with a lot of experience, a real lifetime experience that design a lot of things, that's worked with a lot of cooperation, with a lot of studios for a lot of people. 
The second reason why it's a good school, because they're really talented people that will give all their heart to do the best job they possibly can. So you really learn a lot from the students that come here, that are really diverse, that come in from all over Israel and sometimes a lot of other places in the world, and from the teachers as well. So my name is Yoni, and the watch is called the uh, Chronoline. It's basically a touch-based design for the blind. The main principle of its existence, you can get blind at any age from a variety of different reasons. Well, the watches that exist for the blind today are somewhat lacking in design and in comfort. The most common watches are talking watches that are impractical if you try to use them in a very, very noisy environment, but they're very, very inconvenient if you try to use them in a very quiet environment, like a meeting or an appointment or something like that. So the idea here is to make an intuitive design that will allow people with blindness or visually impaired to be able to read the time without having to learn a, a different language that is Braille. The watch face is basically lines that goes up and down according to the time, and you just feel it by touch. I designed it with uh, multiple people that experience blindness in various stages. With their feedback, I created this design. Does it move? Does it tick? So I can show you here the video. The way it works is that there are several uh, small servo motors that uh, push up and down uh, lines and that way you can just oh. move your finger on top of the surface and you can literally feel the time as it goes by and as you can see there are two rings the inner ring is a bit longer that represents the hours and the shorter ring is representing of the minutes and in times that aren't in groups of fives let's say two and two minutes for example two lines actually rose up and that way you can tell if you're late or if you're early or you can have like a graphic visualization of the time and that's something that is lacking in existing watches for the blind. Very interesting. I think I'm impressed by the practical aspects of a lot of these projects in the industrial design floor like yours for example. Thanks. I mean it means a lot. What what do you think of Betzalel now that you're graduating? Well, I think that Betzalel is a wonderful greenhouse for designers. I mean, what it actually allows us to do is not only think about industrial design as a method to produce products, but also as a method to examine the world around us and try to see if design can be utilized both as art and both in other practical ways. And it doesn't limit us. So that's the main thing that I like about Betzalel. I'm Reut Marwit. I designed a set of benches for the entrance of the new building of Betzalel, the new campus here. The campus was very bare when we first got it, and I thought I can add some of a touch from the students here. And what is special about your benches? Basically, these benches can be arranged in certain ways to allow students to sit in all kinds of ways because students don't usually just sit like on regular chairs. They like to lay down, sit in big groups, sit in smaller groups. So these basically you can compose these benches in different ways. So you can sit in bigger groups, smaller groups, and in different levels. And where were you in your first year in this building? Because also part of this event today is the new building. So we started in a campus in Haratzofim. This year we moved into this new building, and so everything's new. Everything's a little... We're missing the touch, the livability in the, this building, the different things that people usually bring in with them when they move into a place, and, and just trying to fill up that kind of space. So my name is Dor Zerkavod, and this project is 1G. It's a simulating gravity suit for travel in deep space in zero gravity. The concept of this suit or the concept of this project was born from my fascination with deep space travel and the idea that soon enough in the next decade we will be venturing off or humans will be venturing off into deeper space 
and there are problems that zero gravity creates on the body because of the lack of gravity that we have here on Earth. And I went on to explore what are the solutions that I can provide as a designer to enable more people to be able to go to space because right now space is secluded for very prestigious, highly trained individuals. And the whole concept of this project was to find the solutions to enable the body to withstand zero gravity so everyone can go to space. Okay, and what is this strange outfit that I'm looking at? So the strange outfit is born from the concept of a technology that is now being prototyped, but it is a 3D knitted textile that is electroactive, which means that it gets an electric pulse and it knows to contract and concede with a program. And then all the rest of the stuff around surrounding the textile that you see are pressure sensors and thermoelectric generators to enable the suit to capture body heat and transfer it into energy so the suit doesn't need to be charged as much. So there's a lot of technology that is put into this suit. The other concept that we were working with is to enable the suit to be worn as much as possible so that there's less effects on the body. We put in special zippers for going to the bathroom. We put in a display for people to be able to recognize each other or know which nationality they come from. The zippers are very intuitive, so it's very easy to get in and out of the suit. That's basically it. Okay. Now I notice on the video you have displays of astronauts from the 1960s, and they wear these big bulky suits and the suit that you designed is very thin, almost skin tight. Yes, um, exactly. So the suits that they're wearing in the videos that I'm showing are previous versions of trying to create these pressurized suits for space living. I'm presenting on the poster that you can see here. There are alternative solutions that are being demonstrated or they are in production. Uh, my suit does it with the special technology that soon will be patented, therefore could go on to lead the production of these suits for future space missions. And one day would you like to go into space? Um, yes, I would. I would love to go to space. Anyone who's willing to take me to space, I would go to space. I'm in f fascinated by what can happen in zero gravity. And anything about the Betzalel school that you want to share? So Betzalel as a school has provided me with all the tools to enable to assess, research, and design my visions, which I've always had a problem with since childhood. I've never actually been able to actually create my ideas. And I think four years here in the industrial design program and product design has helped me develop the intuition and also the tools to enable to create this project. I personally think that Betzalel really, really admires students that try and break the rules, try and create things that no one has ever done before, no one has thought possible. It's not as conservative as other schools that I know and I've been to because I've been on uh, semesters abroad to other schools and I've seen how other schools act towards industrial design. And I love that I can do a conceptual, technology-based futuristic project that they enabled me to do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, women, it's uh, very hard for them after the breast cancer to look at their self and to deal with this new body. So the night gun is based on the principle of high-tech technology who gives uh, to her a calm mindfulness sensation about her own body and not only the treatment effects, the, the pain of the treatment. I'm Daniel. I made a futuristic race car. It's based on the maglev technology, which has magnetic levitation engines similar to the maglev trains in Japan. 
and they took this to the extreme and made a race car for uh, 2048. The car is very extreme. It has different maneuvers and different pushing plates to increase the action on the race. Since it's 2048, the audience is a different audience, so the expectations are different. So therefore, I made a very action-paced car. That's it in uh, short. And it floats? It does float. It's based on the maglev technology, which makes, makes it uh, hover above the racetrack. It has four points of levitation to make it like four by four car. So it has like four points that you can maneuver on the car. It has like here, here, and there, and there. It also has three levitating positions. One is grounded when it's not driving, and then it can lift off to 20 centimeters, and then it drives off on this same height. There are like obstacles on the course that change whenever you finish your lap. It changes the obstacles, and you can maneuver above the obstacles, so you can lift off for one meter as well. You have ramps, you have loops, you have barricades, and you have holes in the grounds that pop up uh, randomly. And the main focus is to test the ability to maneuver obstacles and to adapt to the different racetrack each lap that it changes. And we see before us a prototype model of a car. Does this really levitate? No, this one doesn't levitate. You can see... This one lifts off by two poles, PVC poles, that makes like the illusion of a levitation. But if I tricked you, so uh, I think I did it well. <laughs> but in your vision, 2048, and now we're in 2023, so that's like... It's, it's pretty close, but by the, the pace of the technology, that the technology is very increasing and changing very fast. So I believe it might be possible in 2048... We'll have to wait and see. And a person will drive the car? Yes. This is like a case study of a race that features the technology. But eventually it might go to a private car, maybe like 2050 or like, you know, a few years after. So it's like a case study to test this technology in a car. And would you like to be a race car driver in this actual car? I wish I could, yeah. yeah. I think the fastness and the, the maneuvering and the obstacles might be a very, very challenging part, but it might be really, really fun and worth it. And what do you think about Betzalel now that you're graduating? I think it's, it's a great place to study. And uh, it's, as you can see here, most of the projects are very, very different. So it has like this open-minded place to do whatever you like and focus on it and try to achieve whatever you want to achieve. So my project is about giving adults the opportunity to play as children do because adult doesn't have any games that are like free play. All the games are have rules and have goals or they're too general or like Lego is a little bit too free. So if you lacking of inspiration of what to do, it's kind of hard to start with building with it. So my project already giving you a starting point so you can start and just try to put the pieces on top of each other and then the idea come from starting the process of creating. So I cut in the table saw, I cut like small pieces, square pieces, boxes like of 12 on 12. I also tried different width of the pieces to fit between 10 and 15 millimeters until I found the right size and then I glue all the pieces together with masking tape and constantly change the, uh, the pieces to see which pieces works best and how does it look when they are connected and gave to a lot of people to try them out and to build stuff with it and based on the reactions that I got from people and trying the pieces I designed the pieces to be the best solution to a lot of construction to like a lot of possibility to build with. And tell us a little about your experience at Pizzalao and what you think of it now that you're graduating. It was a long four years. Also the COVID time was quite hard on us because learning how to carpenter during Zoom is quite hard but we manage and I think that 
like everybody's here is really want to help you and for you and all the teachers are quite amazing. It's really fun to work with designers that I see on the market and I see their product and then they teach me and I'm just like, oh my God, he designed this product. I know this product. This is why I came to school here and now he's teaching me. So also really hard and sometimes can be really stressful and overwhelming and a lot of stuff to do. The expectation and quite hard as well. Hello, my name is Hessel Chang. My project is Snuggles. It's a smart, interactive sleeping friend for children. It's a night lamp that has AI technology that uses communications to talk to children and help them fall asleep. Whenever they wake up middle of the night afraid, Snuggles will be there for the child. And Snuggles can also sing songs or read books have communications with them and educate the child to fall asleep and adapt a natural, healthy sleeping pattern as well. It also has a monitor for parents to actually know the life status of the child, if the child is falling asleep or is still talking to snuggles to fall asleep. And it also has a alert mode, as you can see in the middle photo over there with the red light. It vibrates and tells the parents that the child needs immediate help in case of an emergency or the child has a hard time falling asleep and the parents is needed immediately. It also has an application for all kinds of settings, for example, the name of the snuggles. It doesn't need to be snuggles anyways. And also parents can know the conversation of the child. It has the history features over there, also sleep reports. The reason why Snuggles has eye motions is to... You know that when you watch someone yawn, you immediately want to yawn yourself and you naturally follow them? Yeah. So that's called a mirroring psychology that whenever you see someone getting all relaxed, it helps the person watching them be relaxed as well. That's why I added animation motions inside Snuggles so the child can also feel relaxed and fall asleep with snuggles too. And have you tried this with real children? I don't have a child. I am living with with a family that has a elementary school year old child. She kind of inspired me because she also has a hard time falling asleep and she's afraid of the dark and she thinks that there are monsters in the darkness. That's where it all began and Listening to your stories, it also reminded me of my own that I also had fear of darknesses. And when I talked about it to my parents, they told me that you had the biggest monster that I could, I have ever known, and you were afraid of the dark all the time. And maybe that's why it kind of influenced me now on. And how did you design this? What computer programs did you use? And how did you sew the actual stuffed animal? And Well, mainly I always begin with sketches. And from there I move on to 3D modeling, a program called SolidWorks. That's what we learn and use here in Betzalel. And also key shots for actual three-dimensional color effects and all as you can see in the posters as well. And with the doll itself, I hand sewed parts of it and also used the sewing machine as well. Okay. And what do you think of Betzalel now that you're graduating? Wow, I think Betzalel is a, a school of opportunities because Betzalel helps you and teaches you how to think and how to like develop your own projects. All the professors, they help you as much as they can so that your project can be the most instead of trying to manipulate you into making your project look good so that they would look good as well. I think like Betzalel really gave me a lot of opportunities. Like there are so many different courses. For example, there are car designs, toy designs, like and also like fabrications and materialistics. And so you really can choose the courses that you prefer on learning in the fields that you are interested in. 
So that's really good. This project called the Barricade 2.0, I did it together with Ophir Danino. So we took the metal fences that everybody knows, like the one that the police uses in protests and in events, and we actually did a reconstruction. We cut them into pieces and made furniture out of them, and we're actually taking them back to the streets for the public to use. We use the phrase uh, in Hebrew, like sitting on the barks, la uh, shevet al barzalim, as our main idea. When people are sitting in the, in the neighborhood, just like chilling on uh, one of the fences, we wanted to capture this moment. So all the objects are usable, like as chairs, and you can take them, put them in other positions, and. And ones that are more abstract and like you don't know uh, exactly how to use them, but like we let the people uh, like choose what they are doing with them. And when we put them in the streets, like we did last month, many people just start to touch them, to sit on them. Some people were sitting and like having a conversation for five minutes and walking away. And it was a really nice experiment to do. This one looks like kind of like a bicycle rack. Yes, actually, <laughs> some people when when you put it in the street, so one guy just like put his bicycle on there, and we actually encourage these kind of things because we want people to use the objects how they want, and uh, we really liked when it happened. My name is Shir Sharabi, and I called my candles illuminate. They are a series of candles that support therapy, a couple's therapy, developed by Dr. John Gutman, the seven principle for uh, making marriage work. And each candle supports one principle. So a couple can light a candle during dinner or just in the living room in the evening and practice each principle. Each shape of the candles is, tells us about the principle. For example... Uh, this one, the second principle, is about all the good things that the partner is giving me. So we have a lot of candles. We can remember to appreciate the little things. We have a lot of little things, so we light a lot of candles. The third candle, it tells the partners to come to each other, to say sentences that will bring us closer. So we light a candle and we remember the principle. And then we can make our friendship stronger and the relationship stronger, basically. And what I try to do, I try to show that objects can help us change our lives. If we have different design, so it will affect us differently. We choose colors, we choose smell, we choose the material, we choose the scenario. And then we can change our lives. You personally made these candles out of wax and yes. designed them? Yes, I designed them and then I uh, made the, the molds and then I pulled the wax in and I made it from scratch, basically. But it's a simple uh, wax with color and with smell. And have you personally, with your uh, family member or partner, you know, lit a candle? Uh, we didn't light a specific candle from this, but we tried, during my project, we tried all kinds of candles, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like candles, like Jewish people on Shabbat, but also different cultures, and there's something about that. Yes, I took inspiration from this, and we have like also Japanese and Indian, and uh, I took all kind of objects, uh, not necessarily candles, that can change... The, they are not uh, uh, practical. Uh, for example, record, pl record player, we don't need it, but we like it because it creates uh, this environment of music, of listening, of focus. So I took the inspiration from objects like that. that they are not necessarily practical, but we like them because they put us in a specific environment and they help us create the situation we want state of mind. And what do you think of Pizzaro now that you're graduating? I'm glad uh, to graduate. <laughs> it was hard, but it's a, it's a very intriguing place. Like, okay. Good and uh, mm -hmm. 
We have some difficulties, but uh, it's a great opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Sunny Lusto. So my project was made to provide active cooling for endangered areas of coral reefs underwater that suffer from coral bleaching. In this project, I designed underwater structures that I named Nerates. And these structures are made up of a thermoresponsive biocompatible hydrogel that is called NIPA. I've been working with this gel for the last two years at the Rakach Institute of Physics. And the unique thing about this gel is that it's, first of all, it's biocompatible and it is used for engineering tissues, for implants and things like that, but it was never used in a way that is similar to this. It's thermoresponsive, so it changes its form as a response to temperature fluctuations. And in addition to that, the thing that allows it to change its shape is the fact that it undergoes a phase change, similarly to ice. Ice is first in the state of solid, right, when it's cold, and then as temperature rises, it transforms into a fluid. Once it does that, like phase change, so it absorbs heat from its surroundings. The same happens with the gel, but it happens in a much smaller range of temperatures. So we are talking here about a gel that responds to heat at around 33 Celsius, which is very importantly exactly the temperature in which corals begin to suffer from the heat. So once we are arriving to 37, 35 degrees Celsius, coral reefs are dying. So this gel is responding exactly in this crucial temperature and it can absorb heat into itself. And additionally, it can change its shape. So the structures that I did not only absorb heat, they are made out of multiple leaves of this gel. Thus, they create more surface area, they absorb more heat, but also those leaves are programmed to change their shape in a way that they fold and encapsulate water within them. So they create a cooling vessel. It's kind of a capsule with cold water inside of it, and then it absorbs the heat as well, and it can maintain the balanced temperature over long periods of time. So you can see these final structures there. This system right here is uh, actually uh, showing the transformation of the gel over time. So it changes the temperature of the water inside. And we can see shapes that I was experimenting with and kind of testing what will be their response to heat. Will they be effective in capturing water within them or not? Because I want to create these cool vessels. And another thing that guided me is that when temperatures are normal, I don't want to create any obstacle for water to flow freely and nutrients to arrive to the coral reefs. So in this case, the shape allows free water flow through it when the temperature is normal. So only once it responds to the rising temperature, it becomes this cool water capsule. But usually it just allows this free stream and the idea is to eventually create this underwater forests that that are allowing the stream of hot water to flow through them and in the direction of the reef and then before it arrives to the reef it gets cooled by this forest so sort of a forest in the direction of this flow and have you actually put this underwater yet? Yes, so all these experiments were only made in the lab for now. I never put it in the ocean, if that's what you're asking. I know that the biocompatibility of it is not something that I need to test as much because the material is being used inside of human bodies, but there are so many things that still need to be done to prove this concept in terms of putting it in the ocean in small scales and demonstrating how animals behave around it, marine species, will it maybe attract suddenly a type of a fish that will be interested in this cooling area and then it might affect, it definitely will affect the surrounding area and it can be, on one hand it can be beneficial for cooling the coral reefs but of course there is still a lot to research in terms of what is the effect on the entire ecosystem. And what do you think of Pizzalo now that you're finishing? Well, I loved it. It was an amazing uh, time, four years. I gained so much here. I think 
What drove me in the first place to come to Betalel? I was actually considering going to a different school until the last moment, and someone stopped me and she told me, no, this school will give you practical tools, but Betalel will give you something different. It will give you a way to think. Uh, it will change the way that you think, and it will give you sort of like thought leadership kind of uh, methodology and I really was interested in that more than in just getting the practical tools of exactly how to do something and I think that it really broadened my view and my thoughts. The final project which I would like to share is Keter Cher Martial Arts created by Chen Smadar which was an imaginary sport involving fighting with white plastic chairs. She imagined a sport similar to capoeira and designed a special uniform, padding for the chair, and a point system. Okay, tell us your name and tell us about Kater Chair Martial Arts. <laughs> I am Hans Madao. I make a project that focused about events that we see around us in uh, this time in Israel. People take this very popular chair of Keta. I try to talk about the violence around this event. It's a little bit funny because most of the people that see this project, they smile or laugh. But for me, it's very serious because my studies, it's, it's industrial design. So I ask myself, what is the meaning of the objects around us. This kind of chair, it's, it's only in Israel, so... I have some at home. Yeah. I think we all have some of these yeah. cat chairs at home. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But this specific chair, we see it and we know this icon. So I took it and I tried to ask what is the meaning of this object in our life and what it says about our culture? What do you think about Betzalel? Betzalel. For me it was amazing to explore a lot of things. This is the first year that we are in the middle of the city center and I think Jerusalem is a thing, you know, in the world for us as a Jewish and a lot of culture, and I think design and art, we have a mission. What is this place? What is the meaning to design things? And what is the impact about people? And I think we have a mission. We can do money <laughs> and try to survive this reality. But for me, it means a lot to be here in Israel in this time in Jerusalem and we have a mission in this world to make it better also. Thank you to the students that I was able to meet and I regret not being able to interview more. The graduate exhibition is open until August 18th. This has been a moment in Jewish history. My name is Ben Bresky. You can check out my corresponding article on the exhibition at the Jerusalem Post. For questions or comments, you can email me at bbresky at gmail.com and check out my past shows and subscribe at benbresky.substack.com. Thank you for listening and shalom. <laughs>